Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Bloomington at the David Davis Mansion. You can just imagine how many tea parties must have taken place inside this mansion. Well, we're going to get an education today about how those parties went from the tea ladies. Allow me to introduce the tea ladies. Nancy Perzo, Karen Patton, they are sisters. Many of the programs they do are here in the beautiful David Davis Mansion where we sit today. And what's going to be interesting about this is how well, how well I can be acclimated to real etiquette. Well, this is real Victorian etiquette, isn't it? It yes. is. Some of the programs you do involve tea, some mm -hmm. of them involve etiquette, some of them involve dress from the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. So we'll get a little taste of that today. Good. I'm, I should have dressed like you all. Well, we have a top hat. Why? <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't have it on, would I? No. If I were. Why, why are you dressed like this? Well, Karen and I are dressed like this because we like to do a representation of our programs in costume. And these costumes are about 1890s. Okay, so this is still the Victorian era? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. And the ladies would have worn a lovely white outfit and a hat to tea mm -hmm. if they're coming to call on you. Was, was tea a, a daily thing, Karen? Almost a daily thing, particularly for the affluent families. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was just an afternoon ritual, particularly if you, it was your calling day, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but if you were having a calling day, you might have had the ladies in for tea, um, casual conversation. Gossip would never have been allowed. <laughs> no so gossip. you talked about just topical things mm -hmm. and the beauty of the day and enjoyed each other's company uh -huh. at tea. Okay, what time of day would, would this have been? A cream tea was typically between 2 and 4 mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Sometimes they went even later, um, but a cream tea was your typical afternoon tea for visiting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm all for the visiting, but I'm getting a little thirsty, so where's oh. this tea? Okay, well, <laughs> I'll pour some tea okay. for you. Um, there were a lot of rules at the tea table, and one of them was that when you had um, a tea that had company at the table, someone at each tea table would be the mother of the tea table. And uh, this was a gentleman as well. Mm -hmm. So if you were here serving the tea this day, you would have been called the mother, the mother. of the tea table. But that's just the host or hostess, mm -hmm. Yes, right? it's a term that implies you're the guardian of the teapot. Mm -hmm. You're going to pour for the guests. If the teapot is empty, you would let the lady of the house or the servants know that you needed a refill of your tea. So it was your job to watch the teapot. Okay, so the mother could be a guest. Yes. Okay, wouldn't yes. always be the host. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mother could be a guest. There's somebody Probably who's the taking friend charge of the of hostess the of the house. Gotcha, mm -hmm. okay, all right. Yes. So. so I'm going to use an instrument while I pour the tea that is called um, a tea strainer. It's this piece right here. Um, typically it was silver mm -hmm. and it's in two parts. Uh, they may look different in design but this one's pretty typical. It lifts off the little bucket or bowl mm -hmm. and you would place it over your teacup. So I will, I'll come and pour yours first. Okay. I'll bring my strainer yeah, I'm, with me. I'm the guest so yes. you got to be polite. It's only proper. <laughs> Being proper is important. Oh, always. Absolutely. Victorians were always proper and they never made a mess. Uh, Those are mm. probably two rules. I don't <laughs> fit. I don't fit in here. <laughs> now, I would place the tea strainer over mm -hmm. your cup. Mm -hmm. And that's because typically in this era, the tea was made loose in the pot. So the tea leaves are floating in here. Uh. And you wouldn't want that to fall into your teacup and right. serve your they guests the tea They didn't have tea, tea bags flakes. yet. They, they were not quite yet. leaf tea. Okay. We're, we're getting close, mm -hmm. but not quite. Okay. So I'm going to pour slowly through this strainer, and the little holes in the strainer will allow the tea flakes to be caught in mm -hmm. that little silver spoon. Mm -hmm. and Beautiful you tea. You don't have to drink any. Oh, it smells good too. You really did brew tea for yes, this. Yes, I didn't did. You? It really smells good. Okay. And as you can see, it filters through slowly, mm -hmm. and then you'll remove it. And, right. it on and then you move it around yeah. the table, huh? Yes. Yes. It's going to come to me. Okay. I will. I'm going to put that in your cup right now. And Nancy I'm sorry can't to reach wait. She's not I very can't patient. Wait. This is a wonderful tea. When we do our tea parties here in the parlor, we always use this tea that you're going to drink mm -hmm. today. It's called PG Tips. It's a tea from England. It's the Queen's favorite, so we think it's good for us, too. It smells heavenly. It does, doesn't it? It is a delicious tea with foods or by itself. Okay. Okay, now while you're doing that, I'm going to ask a few questions, Nancy, mm -hmm. because I'm a little curious here. And I know there's some food on the table. There's some cookies and, and some strawberries. Right. But uh, this, for instance, this is, this is empty. It's just sitting here. Yes. What, well, is that not, just for look? You think that's the sugar jar that I forgot yeah. to fill? No. 
This is called, and it appears on every Victorian tea table, it's called a slop jar. That's not a, a very slop, slop jar. jar. <laughs> yes. That doesn't sound very no, polite. No, it's not very polite, it's, <laughs> but that's the actual term for this little jar. Mm -hmm. This little jar is used to put waste in from the tea table. If you're eating a strawberry, you take the top off your strawberry, and you would eat okay. it and drop the top into the okay. So slop this, jar. Yes. this would you'd bite that off and, and drop it and in goes there. In the okay. Slop and you would jar. also, after you've squeezed a lemon, and we'll talk about that, mm -hmm. you would take the lemon squeezings and put it in the slop jar. Mm -hmm. Victorians were all about neat and tidy. You were not allowed to make a mess ever. So these were very important at the tea table. Was it okay for me to that, that you've poured your tea to just start drinking, or do I wait for some kind of signal? You would wait for all the guests to mm -hmm. be served, to be and then you poured. could start okay. enjoying your okay, tea. Okay, then everybody can mm -hmm. have some. So we were all poured now, so I'm Yes, you can have some tea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about this little item on the table. Good. Okay. This is called a, a lemon squeezer, or a lemon bird. This is a modern one. We don't have one from the Victorian era, but mm -hmm. they're fun to use. This little bird, um, no lady would ever attempt to squeeze a lemon with her fingers. You would use this little bird. You open his body up. Mm -hmm. You would place a half a slice of lemon inside the bird's body. Can't do it because it's a fake lemon. <laughs> and then you would squeeze <laughs> okay. the little tail and of you the hold bird. It over your, you and you hold, hold it over your cup, cup and okay. the juice comes out and the his mouth. The bird just spits out that lemon yes, juice right into your okay. And he never yeah, spits a seed. <laughs> and you would have That's used neat. the lemon fork to place the lemon slice inside the bird. Okay, never touch it bird. with your fingers. Right. Okay, all right. What else do we have over here, Karen? What else is over there? Well, is I don't know if you like sugar in your tea or okay. not. Um, sugar cubes were used in the Victorian era to prevent unsightly sugar spills with loose sugar. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to shake it all over the table. So you would take your tongs, mm -hmm. take out your sugar cube. Would you like one in your tea? Sure. Put one in. Yeah, just one. Though. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you lay that back down. Okay. And then that goes back on. Mm -hmm. And no slop. You don't have to do anything with this. No. It's okay. That's, that's fine. Clean enough. Just okay. put it back down. Right. I would like some sugar in my tea too. Okay. Sorry. It was rude that's of me. Right. Not to ask oh. you it's interesting that earlier in the Victorian era, now the Victorian era is a long time mm -hmm. from the 1830s through 1901 so everything changed a lot fashion uh, rules at the tea table but the era that we're talking about is um, new the sugar cube was a new invention at that time mm -hmm. prior to that um, like the Civil War era mm -hmm. and prior was a sugar cone would have been at the table in a probably a silver jar and you would have chipped or shaved away at the cone and taken as much as you wanted and mm -hmm. then lifted it with the tongs and put it in your oh, tea. So okay. probably not as tidy as the sugar cubes. Right. Whittle away at the cone yes. and take little pieces with yes. it. Okay. So here's how you drink your tea. Okay. Take your cup and saucer in your left hand, if you're left okay. right handed. Pick up your saucer your cup. Mm -hmm. Your pinky doesn't have to be extended, but that's okay, a nice they, touch. Okay. There, you go. there you go. Now you're drinking tea in Mrs. Davis's parlor, so you're yeah. gonna put your saucer under your chin just a little bit really? in case you spill it and have a sip. No spilling or dribbling. Very good. Well do done. One, I don't well, think. Very I don't good. Think well done. She'll invite me back. She will invite <laughs> you back. There may not have been a table set up. You would have been seated on this beautiful furniture in oh, the So parlor. you would really need yes, to watch Yes, you would yeah. need to watch okay. what you're doing. Okay, ladies, now that we have fortified ourselves with tea, <laughs> let's go on to some of the outrageous etiquette oh. of the Victorian era. Okay, one of the Gladly. programs you do is called Outrageous Etiquette. And I and I love I, I love it because there was so much, so much sort of phony formality yes. that went along with it. One well of them said. had to do with if you wanted to call on a lady, mm -hmm. it was you might knock at the door, but you might not always get that lady's attention. She might not appear to be home when she is home. And at, at any rate, everybody had a calling card. Mm -hmm. And everybody wanted, of course, to know the lady of the house to know that they had been there and what their situation was. Yes. Right. So there's a, whole, there's a whole culture developed around this, wasn't there? Absolutely. <laughs> and you had to know it well. That's right. <laughs> so give us a little bit of, uh, of that program and show us how it worked. Very good. Well, we're going calling this afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hang on. If Karen is married and the hostess is a widow or unmarried, Karen leaves one of her own cards and one of her husband's. Oh, all right. Okay, that's her own. Mm -hmm. They're all the same, actually. Mm -hmm. Her husband's. Yes. But before you put your last card in the calling card receiver, Karen, bend the upper right corner of your okay. card. <clears throat> and this indicates that Karen visited in person, that she didn't just send her servant over to drop a card in you the bet. receiver. I did it myself. <laughs> Our next scenario, Karen, the hostess is married 
and you just leave one of your own cards, but you leave two of your husband's. Oh. And the reason you leave two of your husband's cards, you're calling for your husband to the lady of the house and her husband. I see. Oh. What's my husband doing at this time? He's watching golf. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, before you put the last card in, though, please take one out and bend the lower right corner of your card up and write the initials PPC. Okay. <clears throat> this means presenting parting compliments. Karen is leaving on African safari and she won't be able to call next <laughs> Lucky week. Lucky me. That's right. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, so now, now she knows where, where, that, that you're not going to be around. Right, okay. that's right. Now, Karen, you're unmarried, so this is easy. Just oh. leave one of your cards for the hostess. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> Great. But before you do, please bend the lower left corner up. Okay. This indicates a call of condolence. Someone in the oh. household has had it. There's been a death in the family, oh. so you're making a condolence call. Know your folds. Mm -hmm, you bet. It be confusing. It means a lot. <laughs> and the last scenario, Karen. On the first call, you always leave your card, but on subsequent calls, you leave two of your husbands. Unless, of course, the lady is out. In this case, you leave both your card and your husband's card. <sighs> <laughs> and now take the I last card out, <laughs> bend it directly in half. In Victorian okay. times, there were many ladies that lived in one household, or you could have had relatives visiting. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to slight any of the ladies in the household. Bending your card in half indicates you called on all the ladies in the household. Very polite. Now we're going to do a quiz and see how you remembered this. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be mean. We that won't would do be that. Cruel. <laughs> that would be cruel. You know, there's a lot of uh, stuff about and I'm glad I, I didn't live in that era because I hate hats. But. Gentlemen wore hats, yes, and there was a lot did. of when do you have it on, when do you have it off, where do yes. you keep it, what do you do with it, and I noticed that you all have a hat here, and I'm kind of curious about what etiquette that might portray. It's interesting that you would ask that. Now, throughout this program, we ask for audience participation, mm -hmm. and it would be typical that you would read upon that question this card. Okay, so I'm, I'm a member of your audience, and you you asked yes. me to, to participate. Okay, here you must have uh, this at the same time. Oh, I hold my you, hand. You do. I don't even know how to hold a hat. Well, I'm going to put it on my hand. You're going to learn. There you go. When a gentleman calls in the morning, he will not remove his outside coat, and he will hold his hat in his hand. Yes. Never offer to take the hat, and do not invite him to remove his coat. No. Take no notice of either one or the other. This indicates his honorable intentions as well as an understanding that his visit will only last 15 minutes. <laughs> on the clock. You're on the clock. On the Isn't clock. that funny? Okay. So my hat's in my hand. Yes. That's right. And that's where it and has to stay. And my coat's on my back. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm not staying. Yeah, 15 <laughs> that's minutes. That's funny. That's funny. Okay, what else do you have to show us here, ladies? Well, we have some things that you might uh, encounter in the Let dining room, yeah. oh, and sure, we're going thanks. to show you a few, to, few of these items. Mm -hmm. The first thing, I'm going to ask Mark if he knows what this is. It looks like a spoon with little tines on the end of it and has a bowl. I, I was going to call it a, a little spoon with tines on the end of it. <laughs> some people call it a spork. Spork. A spork, there it's you go. a spork. Right. This is one of the items in the household that Judge Davis used quite a bit because it featured his favorite food. That's right. This is an ice cream fork. When the ice cream was made, uh, it was very hard, and so this little spoon would perfect break the ice cream, and mm -hmm. you could just perfect. eat it with your fork. Yeah. All right, Karen, you want to do one? And Judge Davis ate a lot of ice cream. <laughs> yeah, well, we know he was that. A big man, yes, yes, he was. He, was he liked his man. ice cream. All right, this is an interesting instrument, very typical of the era, particularly probably important in the Midwest. I, it has time. You know, it looks like a, a bottle opener. I mean, it looks like, <laughs> I, but it can't be a bottle opener. No, not it's not a bottle opener. It. Think of it at a fancy dinner table. This is a corn scraper. No kidding. Yes, so, and it so would have been used. Sweet corn, mm -hmm. and that uh, you grab it off the off the uh, off the ear mm -hmm. with that, huh? Like so. Oh, this is your little guard, so it didn't splash so it and land on your yeah, clothes. Fly all over the place. Yes. Again. Etiquette. Yes, That's all right. about the etiquette. You can't have corn flying across the no, table. No, 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 no. My last little piece here, this little piece, Mark, can mm -hmm. you see what this is? I'm sorry it hasn't been polished. Um, this is an actual Davis Mansion item. Mm -hmm. It appears on our dining room table. Do you oh, have any ideas? Well, it looks like it got bent the wrong way. It was, it was supposed oh. to be a, like a butter, a butter knife. It got bent the wrong way. No? This is called a pusher, and this would have been placed at the baby's place uh, at the table. The little child would have used this pusher on his plate to push the peas or the corn into uh -huh. his spoon and then eat it with the spoon. Even a baby <laughs> could not make a mess in the Victorian era. It's a little pusher. Love it. Another one? Oh, I'll do this as one of my favorites because I think 
people probably had a good time with this. What do you suppose? Well, it's got pl plenty of places for your fingers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's obviously meant to pick pick up something, but I, I can't, well, Look this looks top. like asparagus. <gasps> Very, Very good. good. That, so they're trying to tell us something, right? That's what this is. <laughs> this is an asparagus tongue. Um, asparagus was a sign of wealth or affluency when you served mm -hmm. it in a meal in an upper class home. So everyone had a little tongue at their place setting where you could make a show of picking up your asparagus mm -hmm. off the plate, put it onto your dinner plate, you would set your tongues down, and then it was perfectly appropriate in this era to eat the asparagus with your fingers and make no. a show of your beautiful steamed asparagus. <laughs> asparagus and celery were eaten with the fingers. 200 pieces of silverware and you can eat your asparagus <laughs> with your hands. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> was very gracious of Judge Davis mm -hmm. to invite us into his lovely home. Marcia, um, you're the site superintendent here yes. and one of the first things you see when you enter the family room, the sitting room, is mm -hmm. the portrait of Judge David yes. Davis. Yes. Um, this is a, a really the place to be in because this family room really represents the values, mm -hmm. both both professional and uh, and familial mm -hmm. values of the mm -hmm. Davis family. Doesn't yes, it? yes, and that portrait is is an example of the fact that um, Judge Davis was a very important person uh, here in the community, but also in the life of Abraham Lincoln. If uh, Lincoln had not existed, Judge Davis would never have become a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. And then from there, he retired and was elected as a U.S. Senator mm -hmm. representing Illinois. And so that photograph was taken when he was serving in the U.S. Senate. So he was you know, very, very famous in Beautiful his day. home, about five years. He started this home about five years after Lincoln died. Yes. So Lincoln never got a chance to no. see this home. No. But Lincoln visited this property many, many yes. times. Because yes. he and Davis would get in that carriage and they'd go across this, mm -hmm. the state on that, riding that circuit, right. wouldn't right. they? Right, yes. Um, the old home where Lincoln spent so many happy times with the Davis family and where he was entertained was exactly on the spot where the house is mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And so you're absolutely right. Lincoln and Davis left for their journeys together on the 8th Judicial Circuit from this, from this very spot. And we still have a barn that was built yeah. in the time when Lincoln was right. alive and his horse was stabled. This sitting room was, was the family's... Uh, Oh, it was their place to get away from the rest yes. of the world. Yes. Uh, very seldom did visitors come in here. This right. was the family's room. Mm -hmm. It reflected their values, like yes. that bookcase that yes. was specially built for this home behind you reflected his value of education. Right. This is something that drew Lincoln and Judge Davis together when they were very young men and first met in Illinois. They both found that they were members of the Whig Party. And they, uh, they, and one of the the hallmarks of being a Whig was the emphasis that was placed on education, that you could grow up to be anybody you wanted to be, if you could get a mm -hmm. good education and you could teach yourself. You didn't have to go to a formal school. You could simply read a great deal, which is what Lincoln did. And so, in both men's homes, in their private sitting room, family room were were bookcases mm -hmm. symbolizing yeah. the importance of education. Both men also idolized that mm -hmm. famous old Whig Henry Clay of Kentucky yes. Yes. so much so that they kept portraits yes. of him. Uh, yes. and this would have been about the time he ran for president, I guess. Yes, yes. It was in the 1840s that this portrait was painted initially. And then copies were made, prints were made, lithographs, and eventually engravings were made. And they were sold to thousands of Americans. And at some point, the Davises acquired this uh, engraving of uh, Henry Clay, who was the judge's hero. And it was so important to the judge. And Sarah understood that, that when they moved into this house and the judge was away in Washington, serving on the Supreme Court, one of the first things she did when she was furnishing this room was to hang Mr. Clay in his proper place in mm -hmm. the sitting room. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for allowing us to come in with the mm -hmm. tea ladies. We're mm -hmm. going to get back to them in just okay. a moment. Um, but also to remind people that this historic site is a, it's a state historic yes. site. Yes. And it is open for tours on a regular basis, yes. isn't it? We are open Wednesday through and including Sunday from 9 a.m. in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon is the beginning of the last tour. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, Nancy and Karen, you've changed clothes on us again. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Another beautiful Victorian wardrobe. Thank you. Yeah. And, and speaking of wardrobes, 
Um, we're in the very room, this is where we had tea a little earlier, we're mm -hmm. in the very room where Judge Davis's daughter got married. Yes. That's right. And, and one of the programs you do is you dress the mannequin in a replica of that Victorian uh, gown. Yep. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what went into dressing a bride for the big day. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It's a little Not more complicated easy. than today. I'll bet it is. Let, let's get started. <laughs> okay. Huh? Okay. Well, first of all, we have this dress form fashioned in all of the underpinnings of the era. And believe me, she had on many layers. Mm -hmm. um, she would have had on a pantalette underneath everything against her legs. Then came a just soft cotton slip so that she would be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And this is an important part. A lady, no matter what her size, always strived to have as tiny a waistline as she possibly could. Um, preference was 18 inches. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That so seem she possible. is wearing, I know, it's, I'm sure it wasn't comfortable. Yeah. The 21st century is good in that yeah. way. Wow. <laughs> but in the 19th century, you were striving for the tiny waist. She is wearing uh, really a beautiful corset. Yeah. Corsets were boned up and down, and that was to help hold everything in. It would snap down the front or hook, mm -hmm. and then it was sure fashioned that. to lace in the back. And this is where you could get your fit. It was actually fashioned so that you could pull the laces in as tight as wow. they would go mm -hmm. um, to give you that tiny little waistline. Oh, and she needed a tiny waist on her wedding day because she has on many layers of clothing. Mm -hmm. So on top of all of this, she is also wearing um, a bustle. And a bustle was uh, another type of slip. It too had boning in it like your corset did. So she's pretty confined up in here. Now we're confining her and restricting her by putting this bustle on. It's boned across the back and it was usually boned with steel or whalebone. Mm -hmm. The slip itself is heavy, it's canvas. So mm -hmm. you had a lot of extra weight on. Plus now with pantalettes, a slip, a corset and her bustle, she already has four things around this her tiny waist. waist. Wow. And we're not finished yeah. yet. As if this bustle is not big enough for the fashions of 1870, we're going to put another bustle on. Mm -hmm. And you'll see why when I put the skirt on this outfit here. This was called a pillow bustle. And it was to enhance the original bustle underneath a dress line. And a wedding dress has a very long train. She wants a very distinct silhouette. And so the pillow bustle goes on top. Some of these were so big they actually called them teacup. Uh-huh, I can see and why. And evidently at some point in time, young ladies found that you could actually put your teacup and saucer on the back of your friend's <laughs> bustle and balance it there. So I guess that was a form of <laughs> entertainment. Over this, we're going to put another slip because we want the line to be smooth. We don't want, like the lumps and the bumps that we've mm -hmm. created with all the bustles. There's her strings. Here they are. She has such a little waist, I've got to take it in a little bit for her. Yeah, she would be glad to hear that. Yes, well, she we would. That's She's right. been starving herself for a long time oh, to get into goodness. this. And it's probably about this time in the process of dressing, you realize you really want your boots on already. So oh, she yeah. better have her wedding boots on because you can't bend oh, over to put on your shoes. And you better have gone to the bathroom. You don't want to have <laughs> oh, to get yes. out of this thing once you're... without saying. But you also see why they needed dressing attendants or servants to help mm -hmm. them dress. There is no way you could get all of these layers on by yourself. Okay, what is she fighting with? I'm fighting with the big skirt here. This portion of the wedding gown is the, the dress and the train. Uh -huh. uh, Sally's gown was actually uh, longer than this. This is a replica of Sally's gown. Mm -hmm. But uh, her train, Nancy, how long was Sally's train today? I don't know, at least seven feet. Okay. Wow. This one's a little shorter. And they were married that. here in the parlor, like you said. Mm -hmm. Am I pulling down her? I am. There we go. There you go. Would you take that out, Karen? And this is where you see the silhouettes start to form. It's a beautiful piece of the gown, but it's not the prettiest part yet. And when she walked or danced, attempted to dance, um, she would hold the train over her arm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now see why we need that pillow bustle? Yeah. Okay. Now, men didn't have to go through all this. You just put on your tux, mm -hmm. and you're ready to go. Yeah, things haven't changed that and much. And that top else, hat. No. And, the, and the hat. That's Don't right. Don't forget the hat. Now, this is the portion of the gown that has the detail, the beautiful ruching in the back. Um, Point that out for us. This is the ruching, all of this where mm -hmm. it's pulled up in the satin mm -hmm. billows, and it sat over the yeah, bustle. Yeah. And then you have um, details, like yeah. silk tassels. And the fringe, yeah. It was tassels. common in this era to use orange blossoms. Uh, they found out that fresh blossoms would wilt, obviously, really quickly. So wax 
blossoms became popular to use. Mm -hmm. So that's an overskirt to the gown. Okay, she keeps losing her cami, yeah, doesn't she? There we go. Oh, that's and then lovely. her jacket. Talk about more detail. Look at that. Lots of detail. Mm. And this jacket is such a statement of the era. There's a lot to it that tells us the time frame. First of all, you'll notice inside there's yet another corset. Oh, yes, there is a corset in. inside this dress. I forgot mm -hmm. to show it. I can't do it right now. And that corset would have pulled in under her ribs to make her yet tinier and more fitted on top. Also important to the era, particularly on your wedding day, was modesty. Mm -hmm. um, you were not to show any skin. Usually at any time, dinner gowns were acceptable, but on your wedding day, everything should be covered. Mm -hmm. This included the nape of your neck. Uh, hairdos were upswept to put on your veil, so you had to hide your neck. And there's a little panel back here of lace that would do that. Uh -huh. The sleeves were long, and not only did they stop at the wrist, it extended beyond that onto your hand so that your hands were covered up. And now you have the finishing I touch, have the veil. don't you? Yeah, this is, would this be the last piece. This would have gone piece. up on mm -hmm. top of her head, mm -hmm. and it just oh, sits in her beautiful hair, and there she is, yeah. the bride. And it was common to have um, an arch built to put in front of the mantle of the fireplace, and that served as your altar. Mm -hmm. um, the Davises did have their parents as attendants, Sally did, and the uh, groom had his parents here mm -hmm. as well, but no actual attendants. Yeah. So, a over formal three, affair, but right here in the yeah. parlor. And over 300 people attended, and they came by train from Chicago. I don't know where they put 300 people in here, and it was catered, of course. Yeah. So it was a very elegant affair. Ladies, thank you so much. You're so it's very welcome. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah, thanks. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, good. We like to help, help to share tea. history. <laughs> <laughs> the tea ladies here are, cannot only be found here at the David Davis Mansion, but they also do programs at schools and nursing homes and libraries and ladies' clubs throughout the state. With another Illinois story in Bloomington, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.